Good evening to all our friends from around the country and welcome to the fourth and next to last session of our Lenten study, Faith in Action, the Call to Justice. I am Martin Dickinson, co-chair of the Washington National Cathedral Sanctuary Ministry. And on behalf of both the cathedral and our partner, the Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church, let me say that we are very pleased that you can join us for this evening's discussion. The chat box is open now so you can tell us where you are streaming in from. And if you want, describe what your Lenten practice is for this year. Later, we will open the question and answer box where you can put your questions during the question period. Before I say the opening prayer and introduce our speaker, I have a special message from the Judean desert over 6,700 miles away. Recently, a group of archeologists, biblical archeologists, rappelled all the way down into a deep cave on a cliff overlooking the Dead Sea. And there they found new and very tiny fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls over 2000 years old. And using modern technology, specialists pieced together fragments of an 11 line portion of the prophet Zechariah chapter eight, verses 16 and 17. And they made them public just the other day. And what an appropriate message it is to receive in the middle of our session on the call to justice. Zechariah chapter eight, verses 16 and 17. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to one another. Render true and perfect justice in your gates and do not contrive evil against one another mm -hmm. and do not love perjury because all those are things that I hate, declares the Lord your God. We continue tonight in the light of that call to justice and with the prophetic voice that is so needed today. And so let us pray the prayer of the Washington National Cathedral Sanctuary Ministry. O loving God, look with compassion upon all immigrants and their families at our humble shores. By your power, shield them from harm, preserve them in peace, and deliver them to the joy of your salvation. Equip us, your servants also, to gladly welcome strangers, care for the helpless, and provide for the needy. And keep us steadfast in faith, hope, and love until at last we reach that heavenly city where there is weeping no more and sanctuary for all. In the name of our God, amen. And now, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for tonight, Reverend David Uloa Chavez. Padre David is putting faith in action and responding to the call to justice along the Arizona-Mexico border, where the challenge of helping migrants has been present, not just recently, but for decades. Reverend Chavez is missioner for border ministries of the Episcopal Diocese of Arizona. He serves on the Diocesan Anti-Racism Committee and as Bishop's representative to the steering committee of Cruzando Fronteras, an interfaith ministry helping migrants. He is also a member of the Advisory Council for Latino Ministries of the Episcopal Church. A native of Arizona, Padre David, holds master's degrees in theology and divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. And we truly know his work because a group of us from our cathedral ministry went to the US Arizona border in 2019 
And there we met him and learned about the challenges to which the Diocese of Arizona is responding. And I'm happy to say that we became friends. So David, welcome and thank you for being our speaker tonight. Thank you, Marty, uh, for that introduction and for the hospitality. I'd like to begin our time together and before I share my screen uh, this evening by acknowledging and paying respect to the Oho Odam, Yavapai, Akimel Odam, the Hohokam, Yavapai Apache, Hopi, Navajo, ancient peoples, as the original inhabitants of the land and their role as custodians of this land given to them by our one and only creator God. We commit ourselves in the Diocese of Arizona to actively work alongside indigenous people for reconciliation and justice as we live into our baptismal covenant and respect the dignity of every person. I would also like to thank Celeste Bryan of the Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church and you Marty for, with the National Cathedral, uh, for this wonderful opportunity uh, to address this urgent question, a question about migrant justice at the US-Mexico border. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, a good group of friends, uh, all of the folks that are serving and working along the US-Mexico border, Flor Salivar, the Diocese of West Texas, Mike Wallens, Anna Reza, Canon Lee Curtis with the Diocese of the Rio Grande, uh, 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 Diane Rios, the Diocese of San Diego, and here in Arizona, Father John Caleb Collins, uh, who is in Douglas, Agua Prieta, uh, folks who are serving and doing their very best to continue to provide faithful welcome uh, to be the presence of Christ on the US-Mexico border. And I'm privileged to serve alongside them. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen this evening to start uh, uh, my presentation with y'all. Let's see. And here we go. I'd like to spend a few minutes just going over some of the territory that we've covered in this series. Uh, and it's, it's really is a joy to be part of a lineup of, of scholars, of practitioners, of, of followers uh, that are committed to the fight for justice of, uh, so I wanted just to go over a few of the, the, the points that I picked up along the way, some of those nuggets that I picked up along the way. If you recall the first, the first of our series, uh, this series was uh, Faith in Action, the Hebrew Scriptures, and uh, Rabbi Sonny Snitzer talked about social justice and how social justice permeates the entire Jewish tradition, uh, not just the Torah, but also Jewish mysticism, the Talmud and the Proverbs, that social justice is, is it permeates all of what is considered Jewish scripture. If you recall the phrase to kum olam, to repair the world, that sense of, 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 of justice that is rooted in that longing and that impulse to restore the world, to restore a wholeness, to gather the shards in order to restore wholeness. And I'm gonna to be touching on this particular piece as it relates to uh, migrant justice. And recall also that uh, uh, some of the uh, rabbinic writers that uh, Rabbi Schnitzer uh, introduced us to that, that held that on three things, the world stands, Torah or covenantal teaching, worship service and deeds of loving kindness. And that text that uh, Marty read that was recently discovered certainly you know, is a sounding of these things of justice, is a sounding of these things of this active involvement. You know, justice is not this abstract idea, but it's this embodied practice of not only individual practice, but a communal practice uh, of, of, of seeking justice and truth. Uh, one of the other rabbinic writers recall, says that three things, uh, on three things the world stand, truth, justice, and peace. Again, this theme continues throughout uh, uh, the Hebrew scriptures. 
and 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 then the, the fundamental the fundamental uh, idea that God is a God of justice and mercy that undergirds how a community understands its self identity and its practices. And my favorite phrase from the evening out of Leviticus, Sedek, uh, Sedek, Tior of justice, justice you shall seek. That phrase ran in my head all week long. And as I was preparing today's uh, work, uh, it kept rolling in there. Sedek, Sedek, Tior of justice, justice you shall seek. The following conversation was around faith in action and the New Testament and Canon uh, Hamlin of the uh, National Cathedral provided just amazing genealogy and this connection to this Judeo-Christian framework where, where neither collapse on one another. There was no supersession of themes or, or, or theological ideas, but there's this coming together of this impulse for justice that is carried through the scriptures uh, and 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 also how that was lived out within a particular Roman Greco context, and how context where justice is practiced is important to understand. Uh, and uh, Reverend Hamlin, Dr. Hamlin, talked about the importance of this incarnational dimension to seeking justice. Again, as an echo of what Rabbi Schnitzer shared with us, this is not justice as a concept that is devoid of any earthly engagement. No, this is justice is engagement, embodiment, being before God and before the neighbor. And then there's justice as, uh, as discipleship. Uh, the, the very fact that when we follow Jesus, we follow the Jesus that leads us to cross borders, to enter into spaces, to pronounce justice, the same God of justice and mercy. And then of course, at the end, uh, uh, drawing on Howard Thurman's uh, A Strange Freedom, uh, Reverend Hamlin talked about the act of decision and the call in the New Testament to act, to act in a way that reveals that we're pursuing justice, that there's an energy that's released in the pursuit of justice. And last week, uh, it was uh, the Reverend William Lamar IV who brought it down to the roots, as he said, the sense of a radical, uh, a, a, a radical perspective, a radical reframing of, of Luke 4, 16 through 21, and also this returning to roots as finding the ground in our creedal confessions, in our creedal proclamations for this Trinitarian framework that sources our approach to justice. The faith in action is rooted in what we pray, what we say, and what we do. Um, faith in action entails an embodied proclamation and the demonstration of the good news. And then the final piece with the sacred scripture, scripture is both a source and resource for our practices of faith and action. I want to join this chorus of, of, um, of thought, this chorus of theological reasoning uh, by proposing that one important piece of the puzzle is looking at the sort of sacramental ground for justice. And we find this in the baptismal covenant that uh, we in, in the Episcopal church is used, uh, uh, especially around these two quotes. When the question is asked, will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? And then of course, the follow-up question is, will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. That's the Book of Common Prayer, page 305. And I'm using this as a way to ground the conversation this evening, to ground it in this sacramental language, because we recognize that the sacramental is not something that is off the ground, but it's actually rooted in, 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 in existence, in historical existence. It's rooted in the every day life that we live, especially this, this in the sacrament of baptism where we, where we 
you know, we feel water, we hear water, we, he, we, we, we share and open our hearts. And when we make these commitments, and so the sacramental ground for justice is rooted in our baptismal covenant, that we will strive for justice and peace among all people, respecting the dignity of every human being. Now, my sons uh, really, really went to town on me and said, Dad, Dad, you're having a boomer moment. No offense to boomers, but Dad, you need to stop writing so much. So I apologize for all of the text here. But I wanted to talk about migrant justice as the Imago Dei and the narrative of the empire. And I'm drawing on the work of Tisha Rajendra in her book, Migrants and Citizens, Justice and Responsibility in the Ethics of Immigration, an important book. I recommend it highly. She talks about how what we need to do is get at this exclusionist narrative. Uh, understand that there's a narrative out there that is exclusionary or at its heart, which, which proposes the following. Migration proposes, poses a security threat to citizens by way of terrorism, drug trafficking, and gang violence. This is the exclusionist narrative. Migration poses a security threat to citizens by way of terrorism, drug trafficking, and gun violence. One way this is sort of revealed is through a lot of what is uh, developed in popular culture around movies. If you've seen the movie um, uh, Sicario, and then the follow-up movie, Sicario, Dia del Soldado, this is the intersection of ideas they pull together when they talk about the border, when they talk about migration. It's to draw these pieces, terrorism, drug trafficking, and gang violence, almost continuing this narrative of the empire. And so the lie, so, so the lie uh, is that society must be defended, which gives rise to mechanisms and state apparatuses and propaganda meant to frame up a narrative that justifies the allergic reaction to others and otherness, that subjugates the agencies of others uh, to categories and practices of deterrence and or confinement that are death dealing. And that at least in our own national context expands the U.S. expands the reach of our own sensibilities here, the allergic reaction uh, to otherness, death-dealing apparatuses and practices that extends this beyond the geographical limits of the U.S.-Mexico border through mechanisms such as bilateral agreements, American-style border enforcement training and practices, and policy agreements meant to deepen the despair and deter the mobility of people in search of life liberty and justice. In other words, our foreign policy becomes marked by dehumanizing impulses and practices. Based on this idea that society must be defended. And that is a, a quote directly from a French philosopher named Michel Foucault, who wrote an entire book of lectures or has an entire book of lectures based on this specific title. So again, this exclusionist narrative there is danger. Society needs to be protected. We saw this in many ways the last four years and even before that. There is this echo of fear that is rooted, according to uh, Cristina Beltran, in this heron folk democracy that is part of this larger American narrative of expansionism and rooted in a lot of the ideas that have been known as manifest destiny. This idea that we need to be protected, but we can also go out and mess with other people's democracies uh, and implement strategies to help manage or curtail the mobility of individuals. Drug trafficking, and sometimes what's never addressed are the, the pool factors uh, for drug trafficking, the fact that we're the biggest consumer of illicit drugs worldwide. Gang violence, uh, I think um, the past four years, I think we heard more about the Mara Salvatrucha, and many of the gangs uh, on the news, though in Long Island, there's been a long narrative around their presence, but this is one more strategy in this narrative to create this fear of the other. And then of course, one that's been around for the longest time, the cultural and that cultural and religious values of migrants are inherently incomparable with the values of citizens. This can be seen early on in the history of the Southwest border 
with Mexico, especially as it relates to the idea that America is a Christian nation and that Roman Catholics flooding America, the American Southwest, would, might enact a change of allegiance to the Pope in Rome from the president in Washington, D.C. That was a big fear. A great book by the title, Line in the Sand, details a lot of this religious fervor and fear so that protecting the border becomes a holy crusade for the soul of America. This is still in many ways part of the narrative of empire that we and that many migrants uh, continue to experience and that many of us have heard. And of course, the manifest destiny is part of this narrative, set, settler mentalities that advance a nativist perspective that influence how we talk about migrants, immigration, and how we envision a social imaginary without them, borders, walls, uh, keeping people at a distance. Uh, that is the exclusionist narrative according to Tisha uh, uh, Rajandara. In her book, she proposes this definition of, of, of justice uh, that can respond to the relationship between citizens and migrants, justice as responsibility for relationships. And I have to admit, it, it's, it's very simple but it, 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 it really does serve as an echo of a lot of what we share with regard to our baptismal covenant. Will you seek to serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Will you strive for justice, peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? So grounding a conversation about migrant justice or justice for migrants in the sense of a responsibility for relationships is key. And, and I believe is rooted in this covenantal identity that we have uh, as people committed to advancing not only the idea, but the truth claim that everyone is made in the image of God. Now it's one thing, and I will say this right off the bat, that, that, uh, that the pursuit for justice around the question of migrants is, is can be very clear if advocating for immigration policies that are humane, that reunify families, uh, advocating at both uh, state and national levels for a, a, a humane approach to the immigration process. And then there is also these pieces that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, the, again, I, I want to make sure that I emphasize the importance of making sure that we are connecting to the powers that be, representing the, the, this baptismal identity and this call before the powers that be, so that policies are written that reflect a faithful welcome rooted in the respect and dignity of every human being. So what does changing the narrative look like? When Imago Dei as the ground for migrant identity, what does it look like? To start there is it really does connect us with other traditions that hold a perspective that everyone, that everybody is sacred, that everyone is the bearer of, of the sacred, that everyone is, is, is worthy of dignity and respect. In addition, uh, it, it, it requires learning to testify with migrants uh, about the injustices they face from, from the ground of personal experiences of dispossession and injustice, but also from scripture and from our sacramental identity. Uh, this, this obviously, if, if folks are used to a public-private distinction between their faith and their public life, this breaks that down and, and, and calls us to practice our faith in a way that goes public so that our pursuit of justice for migrants is not something that we relegate to an inside conversation within the church, but it spills out into the public square and it manifests itself in advocacy and coming alongside folks who are the victims of the injustices of voicing, but also stepping up and at times, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about this, handing the mic over 
as Nancy Frausto in the Diocese of LA talks about, handing the mic over so that the communities can tell their story. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Dan, Daniel Grody is a scholar who's written a lot on, um, on the ethics of immigration, the ethics of migrants. Uh, it warns us though, to be vigilant about the concepts we use to speak of migrants, because we can end up identifying people principally and primarily in terms of their political status rather than their human identity. And that's why it's important to keep front and center this sacramental language when we're talking about justice or migrant justice or justice for migrants, that we keep that particular thing, that particular piece in mind that we are not simply talking about someone's political status, but about their human identity. Grody continues with this. He says that the work of migrant justice entails helping those on the move, our migrating neighbors, nuestros vecinos migrantes, to discover an inner identity that fosters their own agency rather than imposed external identity that increases their vulnerability and subjugation. A lot of the work that we're doing with Cruzando Fronteras and our partners in Nogales Sonora at La Casa de Misericordia is rooted specifically in this sense of making sure that migrants in the care of our shelter are, are gaining a sense of their, you know, regaining the sense of their agency, uh, of, of discovering not only their, 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 their sense of who they are, but also mobilizing their agency in ways that, that, that enrich the community of the shelter. Uh, in a little bit, I'll share a little bit more about how our partner, uh, Sister um, Lika Macias is creating a context of restoration, of grace, but also of, of, of just like fierce courage among the folks at our shelter, at the shelter that we, uh, we support. Let's see, let me go ahead and advance this. One of the uh, scholars that I've drawn from two here is Berejilio Elizondo. Many of you have no doubt have read his works. When he talks about uh, the, the sense of, 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 of using the right language, a, a language that releases rather than captures, he, he writes that moreover, it's good to remember that in using categories to define, especially as it relates to vulnerable communities, that we remain vigilant about forms of psychological colonization. It was Virgilio Lezona who noted that colonization of communities included the labeling of people like mestizos, mulatos, indio. Elizondo notes that these categories that these are categories that deepen rejection. He writes, such rejection brands the soul in a way worse and more permanent than the branding of a master's mark with a hot iron on the face. That sense of psychological colonization. The task for us engaged in this kind of work, in the work of justice for migrants is to insist that the communities that we speak with and of are never limited to the categories that help us or any agency more easily manage them as communities. Again, as Dan Grody writes, we really, the, the task is to, 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 to help those on the move discover an inner identity that fosters their own agency rather than imposed external identity that increases their vulnerability and subjugation. So I know that perhaps some of you are like, well, where, where's the policy piece? Well, I'm saying policy is important, but I also think that understanding what it means to be in the presence of the migrating neighbor is important how to engage in testimony on their behalf is important, to insist on this sacramental identity and to insist on the imago Dei that everyone bears as the ground from which to begin to move and, and advocate for justice is key, it's important. Uh, and I think it's, 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 it's the kind of theological work necessary when working within migrant justice. So the sacramental restores and challenges. And I'd like to take a few moments to talk a little bit about these categories here. 
The sacramental restores, especially as it relates to migrants, it restores personhood, identity, cultural heritage is celebrated. The sense of the connection with nature is, is, is integral to understanding communities and individuals. Verstan, which is, uh, I threw it out there because it's a, it's a German word for understanding. Uh, and I put it in German because that's what we're, we're fighting here is the Western perspective on what understanding looks like. And I'll explain that in a minute. But also it restores imaginary, the capacity to envision life, to envision safety, to envision a future. The sacramental, I argue, when we, when we come at it from the perspective that all are made in the image of God and that our call as the people of God is to respect the dignity of every individual, it's restorative, but it also challenges. You know, someone has written about the dialectic of erasure, this idea that uh, if we could get you to come in and become this, and then you'll become this, so that you lose, you erase a person's identity. If you've done sacred ground, you no doubt remember this. When they discuss how baptism, this secular baptismal rite was used for citizens coming to America, where they would actually have them go on stage in their uh, traditional uh, clothing, change them into a suit or whatever, as they made their way into what appeared to be like this massive water bucket and then they came out on the other side, American citizens. This is what I'm talking about, this erasure of identity. The sacramental insists that individuals, because they're made in the image of God, have this, this inherent dignity and value. There's no need to try to transform them, to change them, to erase their sense of personhood. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a big piece I think that's important for, for Christians in America to remember that we, we, we're not in, in the business of this sort of secular baptismal rite where we do away or erase a, 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 a community or an individual sense of person. No, we affirm and we celebrate that difference. Heterotopias or the idea of a pluriverse that folks are coming with different perspectives, cosmologies about the world, about uh, their place in the world, about nature. For many, uh, you know, earth is a mother. For many, uh, nature is a living being and to have interaction with this living being is part and parcel of what it means to be human. And I think the sacramental challenge is to unthink mastery unthinking dehumanizing practices and ways of being. Again, this can challenge many of us in the church so that we can now begin to interrogate how we do mission. Do we do mission from a colonial impulse? Are we continuing to drive paternalistic relationships with partners or communities that we're trying to serve? Is it us defining the narrative? Is it us stepping into spaces and mobilizing other people's agency so that things make sense to us? This is important. This has been a, a very, very important conversation for the work that we're doing here in Arizona as we move away from a paternalistic colonial impulse to a partner uh, uh, approach where we're learning quite a bit from our, our partners in Nogales, Sonora, in Naco, because in conversation, we learn to unthink mastery of what it means to be in charge, of what it means to control things, what it means to control a relationship. So unthinking mastery is a key piece. And then this is a very important piece here. Uh, it's a sort of epistemic justice. It's, it's been largely understood for the last 200 years that the West determines what is rational discourse. The geography of reason has been located within the West. Migration, migrants that come, come with their own sense of epistemological notions and ways of being. Increasingly, this is being recognized as, as writers, theologians, philosophers, and communities, indigenous groups are beginning to raise their voices from the Southern hemisphere and propose alternatives to Western rational ideas about truth, about justice, about what it means to be human. 
And so I think this epistemic justice is part and parcel of what it means to reflect on migrant justice. Yes, there's the policy advocating for policies that are humane, that respect the dignity of individuals, but there's this hard work on our part of unlearning the epistemological frameworks that somehow put us into a position above and beyond others that come our way. So epistemic justice, the, the very fact that communities come our way with ways of knowing and being, that's important if we're going to talk about justice for migrants. The sacramental view of migrant justice is prayerfully and thoughtfully, you prayerfully and thoughtfully advocate for, again, immigration policies that uphold the dignity of all humanity, especially in this season where policies are being re rewritten, are mobilized, where Alejandro Mayorkas uh, is in the middle of trying to work out the big mess that he's inherited where things are being renegotiated across these sort of the golden triangles, bilateral, trilateral agreements. We need to be people in the mix, you know, people in the middle of that conversation. That's why I appreciate the work that EMM and the EPPN are doing in the Office of Government Relations for the Episcopal Church, resourcing us not only with language, but also opportunities to be engaged. The work that EMM is doing to mobilize conversations around detention, around refugee resettlement, providing us toolkits, providing us all kinds of resources to implement at a local level, this is key to being prayerful and thoughtful about engagement and advocacy. And so I, I'd say find those resources that bring uh, on-ramps, that provide on-ramps for advocating for thoughtful uh, immigration policies. Stay informed and be an informer of the injustices at play. We need to be the news, the voices crying out in the midst of growing news deserts. It's amazing how many local newspapers have gone under during this pandemic. I think this is a great opportunity for us to step into that space and to keep before our state uh, local legislators, the needs for thoughtful, uh, fair, humane immigration policies. And so be the news, find ways to communicate, start a podcast, inform your church, be the hub that, that, that distributes a lot of the wonderful material that EMM and EPPN and the Office of Government Relations is putting out. And there are other avenues. The Department of Homeland Security provides memos and, and guidance and, 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 and readouts of conversations taking place around migration and immigration and, 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 and a variety of pieces that are relevant to what's happening on the border. Show up. Show up. One of the amazing, one of the amazing gifts for me as the missioner for border ministry here in the Diocese of Arizona is that I inherited a community that has faithfully been standing with migrants, that have been faithfully engaged with immigration policies, that have been faithfully addressing the 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 injustices around detention in COVID nineteen. Uh, the just I inherited a community connected engaged and fearless when it comes to being present, showing up, and also handing the mic over, recognizing that we can tell the story and we can testify to our engagement and the call for justice, but we can also hand the mic over so that those who have been impacted, the dispossessed, those who are coming with their own sense of what life may look like, and their dreams, their narratives need to be told. As I conclude here, I'm reminded of uh, the words of Gloria Aldanzua, uh, famous scholar, Latina scholar. The U.S.-Mexico border es una herida abierta, an open wound, where the third world grates against the first and bleeds. And before a scab form, it hemorrhages again the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. 
borders are set up to define the places that are safe and unsafe, to distinguish us from them. And then Mary McClintock Fulkerson once described theology as a response to a wound. And many of you know Miguel de la Torre's work where he writes borderlands are not solely geographical locations, they're also social locations. And these three quotes are important for gaining a sense of the kind of work needed and taking place along the border when it comes to migrant justice. It is about healing. It is about stepping into those spaces where we pronounce grace, where we pronounce open arms and welcome. But it's also a place where we discover that the justice that migrants bring to us, the justice they pronounce in our land is one that is there to help redeem us. And I believe that, 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 that justice for migrants includes the migrant, the, the justice that migrants bring, that they bring to us not only uh, a sense of the, the God that, that is faithful, but they also bring to us the sense of what it means to repair the world, what it means to pursue justice. When the stranger comes through the desert, they really are the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. They come towards us to provide us a different perspective on life, to unlatch us from the commitments that are in many ways closing our hearts and minds to the realities around us. Yes, amar a Dios y amar al prójimo. Justicia, justicia. Again, the voice of one crying. So the migrant voice is one of redemption, restoration, and the continued conversion of the church. So when we talk about migrant justice, we also need to think about the necessity for us to be called into question that indeed these communities of resistance that are saying no, no to the collusion of corrupt politicians, local and state uh, authorities tasked with caring and protecting communities. When they say no and leave, it's a form of resistance that invites us to, to really contemplate why do we commit to structures that are oppressive? Why do we, why are we comfortable with uh, systemic racism? Why are we comfortable in situations that demean, that deal death, that do not uphold the dignity of others? And so I think the migrant voice and the migrant presence is a redeeming presence coming our way through the desert, a voice crying, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the path. Because in many ways, they come to us to help kick off the redemption of our hearts, to once again clarify what it means to walk in this way that insists on the dignity of every human being. These are communities insisting, insisting on dignity, insisting on a future, insisting on liberty, insisting on life coming to a community in this country that is overwhelmed with stuff, overcommitted to things, a church that needs to have a sense of awakening about how colluded our structures may be, our commitments may be, how we need a radical reappraisal of what it means to follow Jesus. The stranger comes to the desert with this message. Make straight the way of the Lord, the highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places me made straight, the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop my sharing there.
come back on. I'm going to come back on. I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay, I'm going to start my video. And uh, what a beautiful uh, statement, uh, David. And uh, I wonder if you could spell out for our audience uh, what he, many of us know, but not everybody does, what EMM and EPPN stand for. <clears throat> EMM stands for Episcopal Migration Ministry. Um, uh, they are one of the nine organizations in America that work with refugee resettlement. Uh, and EPPN is the Episcopal Public Policy Network. Uh, and what they provide, in addition to the work that they're doing in DC, they also provide amazing readouts uh, of policy at play, uh, bills that are making their way through the hill that are, that, that, that you know, they call us to support uh, just a, a digest of, of, of what can be complicated policy. It, what they do is they, they break it down. Uh, and so uh, they've been very help, well helpful. When I, when I get anything from them, I send it off to our border ministry council. Um, when I get, uh, when I receive any alert from EMM and we have several of our uh, border borderlands ministry council folks that are part of uh, EMM the network they've developed around refugee resettlement and detention uh, and so these are in many ways uh, avenues for uh, information but also uh, resources for practices for practical the practical implementation of the work that they're doing um, so uh, and here's a question from our uh, from our participants, uh, would you and how would you apply the narrative that you've shared with us this evening to the forced migration of African Americans? I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear how you put it. I'm, I'm read the question again. How would you apply the narrative to the forced migration that happened historically to African Americans in this country. How would I apply this narrative? I, I, I think this narrative is rooted in the larger, uh, the, the larger sense of, of um, the larger sense of how can I put this? The larger sense that there is a, and we were talking about this in our book group, reading a book uh, entitled uh, "White White Democracy," um, and, and and the sense that 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 forced migration always serves the needs of a particular group that is, in many ways, um, responding as an allergic reaction to otherness. As also as a way to mobilize agency and, and to mobilize the agency of others, as a, as an exercise of power over others, uh, and, and so when I think about that, I think about that dynamic of uh, of how the powers and principality function at times in this, in this way to displace and dispossess communities. I, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's what comes to mind. Uh, and in and, and, and Christina Beltran's book, it's called Cruelty as Citizenship, she talks about it's this genealogy about those powers and why they function the way that they do. Um, and and, and it's, it's a powerful critique, uh, but this is a, this is a uh, again, this is the, what comes to mind when I, hear, when I hear that question. Thank you. And another question from our... Uh, from our folks out there in the audience, uh, can you say more about the churches, and I think that's churches plural, the churches need to embrace all migrants more than it has been doing in, in, in where we are now and how we move that? The churches need to embrace migrants. Um, I, I think that's, that's key to what it means to be uh, a people, uh, of the narrative of the scriptures of a God that embraces and calls us to embrace the stranger. Uh, it, again, it's not a program. 
Uh, it's, it's not something seasonal or an episode, but I think it is fundamental to that call to love God and love the neighbor. Um, uh, Maimonides talks about the neighbor that, or the, 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 the stranger that comes through the desert and appears before you in that sense that you find the welcome of God there. And I think for the church to open its heart to migrants uh, is, is, is one way to encounter the sacred, the divine God in the face of the other. I think that this is important. A Jewish philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas, talks about a lot about the face of the other. And he says that when we encounter the face of the other, we encounter a vulnerability that challenges us. But we also encounter a vocation, a vocation, a calling that should surge within us to raise this one question, how can I serve? How can I be present? I think that that's a, that's a key piece, but also um, to receive migrants is to receive, again, when I talk about epistemic justice, I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> We're talking about uh, for too long, you know, we've, we've existed with the idea that we determine uh, what is rational, what is meaningful. We, 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 our categories mobilized globally you know, the voice of the other so that it fits within specific frameworks of understanding. Uh, and, and so, I mean, you know, this is, you know, what the Portuguese did, what the Spaniards did. This is, this is something that has been part of this narrative. Uh, and I think it's important for the church to recognize that they may very well learn something new. It may very well learn something or recapture a sense of what it means to be the people of God on a journey by being with, walking alongside, but also recognizing that the migrant is walking alongside you too. It's not transactional. It has the potential to be transformational. It all depends on the humility and the spirit with which we receive the other who is receiving us and who is inviting us once again to discover what it means to journey together. So uh, we're we're running kind of right up against our right against our end time, but there is time for one more question, and here's one that just came in, uh, and it it strikes home with me because we were out there and we saw this. Given the militarization of the borderlands, how do you guys and how do you approach the the customs and and uh, border protection? and those who are charged with uh, securing the border. I know you interact with them. Tell us a little bit about how that works for you and how you feel about that. Well, it, it again, starting from the ground of the sacramental identity and the sacramental space, it really is viewing individuals as made in the image of God. Uh, it, it also, I think requires a sort of prophetic conversation around the apparatuses and the mechanisms used to control not only the folks that are charged with enacting policies, but also the, the impact that it has on those who are the victims or the targets of these, whatever it may be, whether it's surveillance processes, uh, you know, military weapons. Uh, it's it's a matter of continuing to engage in conversation and continuing to see and insist and remind individuals caught in the middle of systems that they're made in the image of God too. Uh, and that this need not be, it's just, there's, there's this, there's this, um, you know, conversation is key and, and we've been lucky because uh, a lot of the relationships that have been established have been established by folks that preceded me uh, as far as the work that they've been doing here uh, on the border. And, and I've learned a lot from, from our folks in Tucson at Grace St. Paul's. I've learned a lot from Roger Babnu, Deacon Roger Babnu, and a lot of folks who step into those spaces rooted in their baptismal identity with an undaunted message of this is inhumane. This is not this is not a humane way to go about this. There is an alternative. 
Uh, and I think to speak into that space that way, by equally calling into question the mechanisms that are being used, the surveillance apparatuses, the militarization of the border, the fact that we continue to insist that these are human beings. And so are you. And we can find a different way is, is key. And, 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 and I get that sometimes it falls on deaf ears, sometimes it doesn't. Because we have members in our congregations throughout our diocese that serve. Uh, in, in those capacities with, with your custom and border protection uh, um, and, and a different a variety of, of, of spaces that are part of this sort of uh, surveillance apparatus. But it really is reminding them of the, the humanity, reminding them also of the, the, the systemic evil that is a part of a dehumanizing process. Uh, I guess there's time for one quick question. Uh, if you can, if you can answer it uh, sure. for us, uh, what what can we do? We are not. In, many of us watching you are not at the border. Mm -hmm. What can we do to help the migrants, to <clears throat> help the immigrants? You know, when Delatore writes that borders are um, both a geographical location but also a social location, I think it's important to remember that uh, it is the location many individuals uh, live with every day. You may not be at the border, but border dynamics, uh, uh, border issues, border concerns, uh, border realities are, are in your neighborhood. Uh, I think engaging and stepping into those spaces to, to, to be present and come alongside, go to a uh, you know, a school board meeting, be the advocate for communities that are on the margin that have been bordered by initiatives that are both, uh, uh, you know, whether it's education, whether it's social services. I think there are ways to be engaged, to engage the larger evil at play, and that is the bordering of communities. You know, I, you know, I, when I go down uh, to Walmart, I mean, the border goes with me just by virtue of my presence, my color, my, my, my background. Uh, you know, I, these, the, I, I bear the border with me. Uh, and so I think stepping into, a, into spaces, making friendships, connecting with communities, being aware of what is taking place around you and where you can step in to be the presence of Christ, but also the chief learner in the room, that's key to doing this kind of work where you are. Uh, and then of course, uh, you know, is you can come out when this pandemic is under control and experience what is taking place uh, here in, 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 in the, you know, US-Mexico border as a way to have an immersive uh, experience, not just a sort of um, touristy experience, but an immersive, hopefully life transformative or transformational experience of what it means to step into this space uh, and to practice faith in the middle of this space. David, I just wanna say, I wish we had time to answer all the questions that have been coming in and we do not. But I just wanna say thank you so very much for your message tonight. And I would like to remind uh, all of our participants and everybody involved that we will have our final, uh, our final session in this Lenten study next Wednesday when we will hear from Reverend Stephanie Spellers and she'll be presenting her new book, Churches Cracked Open, which is about racism in the church and it should be very, very interesting. So thank you once again and I'm hoping that you will uh, be so good as to close us out with a closing prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. And thank you to everyone. I saw many amazing questions and I am more than happy to respond to your questions. I'm at david at azdiocese.org if you really want to engage in conversation because that's, that's, that's uh, this is the way I roll and I'm thankful for your presence and time this evening. 
And uh, Marty, thank you for, and Celeste, thank you for inviting me to be part of this, this conversation. It's truly a blessing to be here. And uh, let, us, let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Bendito Dios, te damos gracias que podemos reunirnos en esta noche, no solamente para aprender, mas para ser transformados más y más a la imagen de tu Hijo Jesucristo. Te damos gracias que podemos llegar y también mantener en nuestros corazones las necesidades de nuestros hermanos y hermanas migrantes y también la necesidad de una iglesia que necesita también escuchar la voz, seguir el camino del migrante hacia tu corazón. Bendice a cada persona esta noche. Que vayan con paz, con gracia y con amor. Todo esto lo pedimos en el nombre de Jesucristo. Amén. Amén. Muchas gracias. Un placer. Encantados. Abrazos a todos. Abrazos a ti.